Hello everybody. So on this particular PowerPoint, we're going to go through all things that are membrane transport to kind of finish out unit two related to, you know, cells, cell structure, function, and this. You can see in the picture a couple different kinds of transport that we're going to talk about uh, as we move through. So things you're going to have to know. Um, Basically, you're going to have to understand that cells want to maintain a homeostasis. So to do this, they may have to maintain their solute, which is things like salts and water balance. And we're going to talk about how they do that and how they move big things across the plasma membrane. And then how the structure of the things that are trying to pass through actually affect um, its ability to move across the membrane and the membrane's properties. So there's two, it says on here three, but I guess there's three kind of major types of transport, passive, active, and bulk. Um, passive transport really is moving things across the membrane in smaller amounts that do not require any energy. So this thing means things like diffusion, osmosis, and we will learn um, facilitated diffusion, which does have a helper, it is facilitated, um, but it doesn't require active energy, which is going to contrast active transport. And then when we need to move a lot of things, then we have bulk transport. So these are terms that I've mentioned before, but endocytosis, which is bringing things into the cell, and exocytosis, which is getting them out of the cell. Um, passive transport main function is to import resources and export waste. So these things are going to just kind of naturally flow where they need to go, as I mentioned, without energy. One key example of this is the alveoli in the lungs. So when we breathe in, we um, inhale oxygen. And um, then that oxygen exchange happens with our blood system that is circulating around the alveoli. So you can see kind of oxygen going into those deoxygenated capillaries and then CO2 or waste comes into the lungs and then we are able to breathe out that CO2. And this happens by passive transport. Things are moving from an area of high concentration, so there's a lot of oxygen in the lung at the time, to an area of low concentration where there wasn't really any oxygen in the capillaries at the time, or in this case, it calls them arterioles and venules. Um, and then vice versa on carbon dioxide. It was high as a waste product in the blood, and now it's moving to an area of low concentration in the lungs for export. This is generally highlighting what I just mentioned. Because it's passive, there's no energy. And when we say energy for the cell, that means ATP. Um, it's moving down the concentration gradient. That's what we call it from high to low concentration. The fancy science term that goes with that is gradient. Um, so wherever there's a lot of it to wherever there's a small amount of it with the goal that it will even itself out to be equal distribution. And things that do this include hydrocarbons, which we already learned about, like hydrocarbon tails for lipids, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water. And in the picture at the bottom, you can kind of see how there's, uh, for example, this dotted line would be a barrier, and then you have a ton of molecules on the left, nothing on the right. And so over time, those little molecules would want to move themselves from an area of high concentration to low, and they can move back and forth. That's important to know. They don't really are locked in on one side. They do move equally back and forth until they reach an equilibrium. So there's about the same amount on both sides, and they just kind of continually go back and forth. This is what it would look like if you had more than one solute, because, you know, cells don't have solutes in isolation. So if you had one type of molecule on the left and one, another type of molecule on the right, eventually they're going to move themselves back and forth so that there is an equilibrium on both sides for both molecules. And things don't have to move in the same direction. In this case, the diffusion for the um, yellowish molecules was to the right, and for the purple it was to the left. Osmosis is a very special diffusion. It's just specific to water. 
So osmosis literally is just the diffusion of water and it's still passive. So the big understanding here is that sometimes solutes are just too fat to get across the membrane. So in order to make the concentrations equal on both sides of the membrane, the molecules can't move, so therefore water has to move. So you can kind of see in this U-shaped picture here that this side, the right side, has a higher concentration of solute. The left side has a lower concentration. And let's say for the sake this is sugar, and sugar molecules cannot go across the membrane. So what's going to happen if you kind of zoom in, those sugar molecules can't really um, move back and forth easily. So it's the water that's going to end up moving. So the water is going to move from the area um, where there's less molecules to where there is more. And in essence, that makes sense because it's trying to make the two sides of the solution in equal concentration. So it's kind of going from the area of lowest solute concentration to highest solute concentration. Because when you're looking at percentages for water, that still really is going from high concentration to low concentration, where there's more water per solute to where there's less water per solute. Um, some of the things that we need to remember in terms of vocabulary are hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic. And they can be relative to the external environment, meaning around the cell, or they can be referencing the internal environment of the cell. And we talk about this in relation to the amount of solute. So if something is hypertonic, it has too much solute compared to what its surroundings. So if I said the cell is hypertonic to its solution, then it has more solute than the solution that it's in. If I said the cell is in a hypertonic solution, then that means the solution around the cell has more solute than the cell. I know it's really confusing, but we'll go over it. Hypo means less. So in relation, for example, if the cell is hypertonic, well then that means the solution around it is hypotonic. It doesn't have enough. And then when things move toward equilibrium, things become isotonic. They are the same or equal on both sides. And in this situation, when the solutes aren't able to move back and forth, remember it's the water that is really moving to make this happen. So in instances, that means cells can swell because water is rushing in, or cells can shrink because water is rushing out. And that leads me to this picture. Um, in an example, if the cell is put in a hypotonic solution, that means the cell itself is hypertonic. So water is going to want to rush in to make that iso tonic or equal. And sometimes that results in so much water rushing in that the cell explodes. That's a lot harder for a plant cell because it has cell walls. So again, that's what makes it very rigid. And that's why the cell walls get, that's what gives it its kind of turgor pressure. If it's in an isotonic solution, well then for a something like an animal cell or a blood cell, that's great because inside and outside is the same. It can maintain its total happy shape. For a plant cell with the cell wall, it can often make it a little flaccid because there's not excess water rushing in to push against those cell walls. It's got kind of an equal amount coming in and out. So it's fine. It's just not got that extra pressure on it. And then when the cell is put in a hypertonic solution, um, that means water is going to want to rush out of the cell trying to make the solution of equal concentration. And so that makes the cell shrink or shrivel. And that's true for both animal cells and plant cells. You can see water would rush out of a plant cell as well and kind of cause the membrane to pull away from the cell wall. Um, and there's a term that we use for that. It's called plasmalized or plasmapheresis, um, plasmolysis, whatever you want to call it. But essentially it's the, the shriveling of the plant cell, but because as a cell wall, it doesn't quite look the same. Okay. So we're gonna eventually learn about water potential and what that looks like. There is gonna be some math involved. So we're gonna come back to this in a moment. But for now, 
we are going to learn about other types of transport. So facilitated diffusion. Passive transport. Um, in this case, facilitate just means to help. So facilitated diffusion means that there are transport proteins, and we already learned about integral proteins that are embedded in the membrane that go from one side to the other. And so these could be an example of those facilitators, those transport proteins that help hydrophilic substances cross. As we remember, hydrophilic substances have a really hard time crossing the membrane because of the hydrophobic tails. It kind of creates this little hydrophobic desert that hydrophilic things don't like to cross. But if you have a, a protein there in the middle that can kind of add an extra passageway, then things can go through. So you could either do something like providing a hydrophilic channel. So this would be oriented so that that channel around has hydrophilic proteins, um, or excuse me, hydrophilic amino acids kind of facing that way to allow transport. Or the other option really is to do something like the second one that's a specific carrier molecule. So it loosely binds whatever it is that's trying to cross and then releases it onto the other side. So whether it's a free-flowing channel or a specific carrier protein that kind of opens and closes, they still get across without requiring extra energy. So things that do this, um, ions, polar molecules. We did learn that um, water can pass in very small amounts, but um, in this case, larger amounts of water, things like glucose need a little assistance. Here's another specific example. It's called an aquaporin. And so this allows passage of water molecules. Uh, you can see kind of on the left, just generally what the structure of it looks like. Um, and then you can see how it's embedded in the membrane and it's got a hydrophilic uh, channel created and then water can freely pass through. This happens um, naturally in the kidney where a lot of water exchange is taking place. Uh, another example would be a glucose transport protein. So uh, again, this isn't a channel per se, but whenever you have low glucose, what happens is there are transport carrier proteins there that bind glucose and release it onto the other side of the cell. So that way, when you eat something, you trap the glucose that's in that food or that high glucose concentration, and then you can put it into the blood to kind of balance it out. And that's shown again there at the bottom in fancier terms, but just knowing that glucose transport protein is an example is fine. Okay, so this brings us to active transport. This requires active input of energy. And as we talked about the cell, active energy is ATP. So there are specific proteins that do this with the input of ATP. And it's requiring this extra energy because it's pushing things against where they want to go. It's going against the concentration gradient, kind of pushing them uphill, if you will, from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. And sometimes we need to do this, for example, with our sodium potassium pump in relation to um, our neurons firing. There are sodium potassium ion channels that open and close and cause neurons to fire, which we'll learn about at a later time point. Um, we also have a proton pump that is used in the process of cellular respiration in order to make more ATP, and that requires to often push them against their concentration gradient. So you can see kind of in the picture, um, they are moving these uh, diamond or square shaped molecules um, from the one side to the other with the input of energy from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, whereas the circle balls are actually moving the other direction against where they would normally go. Um, this would be an example actually of a sodium potassium pump. They have three molecules moving this way and two molecules moving this way. Um, in terms of other examples, there are um, electrogenic pumps as I mentioned for the sodium potassium pump on the left, because sodium and potassium are charged molecules and you have a different number of them moving 
between one side and another side, it can create what's called a voltage. So that unequal distribution of charge creates a voltage, and then later that's what allows neurons to fire. So again, we use that in nerve transmission. Um, on the right, we have the proton pump, um, which is pushing hydrogens or protons across the membrane. And as I mentioned, that's in ATP production. We use that to, to generate more ATP. You don't need to know the specifics of those pathways, just kind of examples, because we will learn them in detail later. Um, another specific example of active transport is this one of co-transport. Sometimes um, co-transport is where you have two things going or working at the same time. So, for example, in the top, we have a sucrose and proton transporter. So we would be moving sucrose um, uphill in an active transport way. And instead of using specific ATP to make that happen, we can actually use the diffusion of protons or of hydrogen naturally by diffusion to kind of fuel that reaction. So that's what co-transport is. Instead of using ATP specifically, it's kind of piggybacking off the energy made from diffusion of one thing to drive the uphill transport of another thing. So as protons freely diffuse across using the transporter from high concentration to low concentration, that fuels the movement of sucrose from low to high concentration. So that's a form of active transport that's a little bit different than just using ATP to make it happen. Okay, so just kind of recapping what all those things are. Passive, little, no energy involved. Things are moving down the concentration gradient from high to low. That includes diffusion, that includes osmosis, and facilitated diffusion that has that um, transport protein helper. Active transport, on the other hand, does require energy. It moves from low to high concentrations, so it is going against the concentration gradient. And this includes things like those pumps that we just talked about. And it also includes the bulk transport pieces, endocytosis and exocytosis, that we haven't really talked about, but does require energies to um, make those vesicles and move them around. Um, here's a recap picture that goes along with that. Um, diffusion has them freely moving across with the purple. Facilitated has helper uh, molecules, whether it's a uh, transport protein specifically with the blue molecules or a channel with the red triangles. And then active would be going against the concentration gradient. Okay, so we know the processes, but how is it actually controlled? It's not something that is done all of the time everywhere. So cells, as I mentioned, want to kind of maintain homeostasis. So we have something called osmoregulation, where the cell tries to control those levels of solute in water to keep the cell happy, because if it's not, then it's going to either shrivel or explode depending on the hyper or hypotonic solution that it might be in. So we have something called a contractile vacuole. Um, it kind of forces out water as it comes in um, by osmosis. So this is an example of a protist that does this. So to kind of maintain the balance, water normally would want to rush in because the um, Paramecium in this case is hypertonic, so water is going to want to rush in. But it has a very special organelle called a contractile vacuole that basically just quickly pushes it out so that the cell doesn't swell and eventually explode to maintain its homeostasis. Going to that bulk transport piece, um, this is for large molecules, more than just one at a time. So when the cell wants to bring in a lot of things or get rid of a lot of things, that's where endocytosis and exocytosis come in. So endo meaning take in, and it buds them in and makes new vesicles from the top picture there. And then exocytosis is the just exact opposite. Um, a lot of proteins that are made from the endoplasmic reticulum 
packaged up by the Golgi are in vesicles that end up making their way and budding to the plasma membrane and releasing. So that's an example of exocytosis. Um, types of endocytosis, depending on what it is that you're bringing in, it gets a special name. Phagocytosis, um, in the leftmost picture, that just means cell eating. Phago means eating, so it just literally means um, cell eating. So in this case, it's eating food or some other particle. Pinocytosis is cell drinking. So this would be um, other solutes, essentially, not necessarily solid food things, but other solutes in the liquid, and it just kind of coats it um, and takes it in as a vesicle also. We also have something called receptor-mediated endocytosis, and we'll, we'll talk about that later when we do cell signaling, but a lot of times our cells have all these little receptors um, on the surface that are waiting to be triggered by something. And so if enough of them are triggered, then the cell basically removes them. It's kind of to prevent overstimulation. So it, it brings them in so the cell doesn't become crazy active or in some way. Okay, so at the end of this PowerPoint, there's another kind of general review that goes through these. So I like this graphic here because it kind of breaks it down for you. You can see what's passive, what's active, and examples of each in the blue. So this is a good kind of review slide for you. Um, and now back to water potential. So there is the math involved with figuring out how water moves across the membrane. Okay. Water moves from high to low potential is kind of the general statement. And the symbol for water potential, I don't know what that Greek symbol is called. I want to say psi, but I feel like that might not be right. Um, regardless, it looks like a trident because um, it's water. <laughs> so that's why, how I always remember it um, from the god of water. And the water potential equation is this. So water potential is equal to the solute potential, which I'll learn in a minute, and pressure potential, those two things together. So solute potential is kind of the solute concentration. It is the osmotic potential or um, kind of the amount of influence that the solute has to be able to move water. And then pressure potential is the physical pressure that's happening. So this comes into particular play when we're talking about plants because they are under a physical pressure. They have that turgor pressure because of their cell walls. So these are generally known values. Um, for pure water, the pressure potential is zero. There isn't any. But for plant cells, because of those cell walls, um, their pressure potential is one. Um, and then based on the solute, then we can calculate the overall water potential. Um, Unfortunately, the solute potential is not the most easy thing in the world to do. Um, it's got its own little sub-formula, so to speak. So to figure out what that solute potential is, here's the equation for it. It's negative ICRT, and you can see what all those things are here. I is the ionization constant, so how many particles are in the water. Um, whether it's Na plus, so then that would be one. Um, if it's got Na and Cl, then that might be two. So how many ions are in the water? C is the concentration. So the molarity of the solution, we're bringing it back to chemistry people, I know. A lot of this information is gonna be given to you. You just have to kind of pick it out and then put it together. Um, R is a pressure constant. So that's never gonna go away. That's the same as the R that's used in um, PEB equals NRT from chemistry. And, oops, sorry, T is temperature. So this is gonna be in Kelvin. 
To convert to Kelvin, we take whatever the Celsius degree is and we add 273. So overall, what this generally means is that when you add a solute to water, it makes the solute potential lower or more negative. So why does this happen? Because as you add solutes, the I value goes up. And since the formula has a negative in front, the higher the number, the more negative it becomes. And so as you add solutes, the water potential is going to decrease. And that will come into play in a little bit. So water is always going to move from the higher solute potential to the lower solute potential. I kind of think of it from um, high concentration of water to low concentration of water. The lower the water potential number is, it's kind of a function of the lower the, the water concentration is. And it's the opposite if you're referencing the solute itself. So higher water potential means that there is a low solute. Um, which means it's kind of more dilute. So the water is going to want to move to where there's low water potential or a low concentration of water with a high solute concentration. And essentially, when you have high water potential, lots of water, low solute concentration, there's a high pressure there. And then it's moving from high pressure to low pressure. We'll get some practice at this. Here's an example. If this beaker has a selectively permeable membrane, um, we have sugar on the left uh, in high concentration, we have more diluted on the, on the right. So on the left, we have high concentration of solute, low concentration of water. On the right, we have high concentration of water or um, low water, or excuse me, high water potential, um, low solute concentration. Water is just naturally going to want to move from where there's um, high pressure or a lot of water to where there's little water, respectively. Same thing here, salt water to fresh water um, through a semi-permeable membrane. So the lot of solute means that it has a lower water potential. And so since the salt isn't moving, then that pressure is going to want to get the water to come over from the freshwater side to the saltwater side. It's kind of confusing because the arrow has it going that way. Okay, so which chamber has the lower water potential? That would be side B. Side B has lower water potential because it has a higher solute concentration. Um, which chamber has a lower solute potential? Side A. Which direction will osmosis occur? So where would water want to go? Um, in this case, it's going to want to move from A over to B to try to make kind of their concentrations equal. So now we're going to actually throw in the math. If one chamber has a potential of negative 2,000 and the other has negative 1,000, which chamber has the higher potential? I feel like you could use common sense on this, um, but overall, general higher potential would be the higher higher number. So negative 1,000 is technically higher than negative 2,000. Um, so water is going to want to move from the negative 1,001 into the negative 2,001. Okay, so here's kind of just putting it into perspective on what that looks like for a plant. So down by the soil, there's high water potential. Um, and it gives you some values there. Um, because there's less solutes, 
Um, so the less solute there is really at that um, low area, there's a lot of water down there. There's not a lot of solute um, in terms of elements of the plant and so on. So that's where it has a high water potential. And as you move up, you can see that that water potential goes down because you're getting farther and farther away from the main source of water and you're having much more solute in relation to that amount of water. So that's why things move from high water potential to low water potential. And one of the reasons that water is kind of sucked up the tree via osmosis. And we talked about cohesion and adhesion too, but it's kind of moving from where it's most concentrated or has the highest potential to move at the bottom to where it has the lowest percentage or to move at the top. Okay, so here is an example problem. Calculate the solute potential of 0.1 molar NaCl at 25 degrees Celsius. I would pause the video and see if you can try it. You're going to plug it into the um, solute potential equals negative ICRT. Um, I is going to be the number of ions. So again, think Na and Cl. C is the concentration and molarity, 0.1. R is that constant that we referenced earlier. And T is the temperature, which you'll need to turn into Kelvins. So if you plug all that in, you should be able to calculate the solute potential. And then based on that, if the concentration inside the plant is 0.15 molar, which way will water diffuse if it's placed in 0.1 molar solution? That one's kind of using logic, but you can use um, math too. Essentially, the solute is more concentrated inside the plant than it is outside the plant. So therefore, water is going to want to move into the cell to try to make those concentrations even. Um, here's just another way to represent the same formula, just kind of recapping. Um, <clears throat> For plants, they do have a pressure potential that regular animal cells don't really have, so you need to make sure you account for that in plant cells. It's going to flow from higher to lower, as we mentioned before. Higher water potential just meaning that there is more water compared to solute. Lower water potential just means that it has a lower amount of water per solute. Um, which way will water flow? I kind of gave it away too quickly. I am sorry. Um, negative 0.5 is considered higher than negative 0.25. So water is going to want to flow into the cell. There's more water um, in the solution. If we want to put words on it, this is kind of showing you that the cell is hypertonic and the water solution is hypotonic. So the net movement of water will be into the cell. As you add more solutes, again, you start to get more and more negative just based on the formula. Water is now more likely to flow wherever there is. So the more negative you get because of the more solute, the more likely water is going to want to go there. In a perfect situation, an open container um, will have a pressure of zero, and that's hopefully where animal cells want to be. They don't want to have any additional pressure pushing one way or the other. In plant cells, however, as I mentioned, they do have positive pressure. Um, and so that's basically how the plant can kind of remain upright against low water conditions um, and become not too flaccid. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is just recapping that formula one more time so you know what it is and have it. Here's generally how you could calculate the I value. Um, if it's one molecule like sucrose, um, it's a singular thing, so I would be one. But if it does form ions in water, for example, NaCl, they do split apart and become Na plus and Cl minus, then that would become two things. So that would be two ions and I would be two. 
Oh, sorry, gave it away again. Good, good grief. Okay, so MgCl2. Um, in this case, Mg and Cl2 would split up, so you would have one Mg plus two and two Cl minuses. So when you're looking at that collectively, you will have three ions. So I would be three. Concentration um, is something that normally you would be given, but just refreshing your chemistry brain, molarity is moles of whatever solute per volume of solution. So the higher the molarity, the more concentrated the substance is. R is that constant, always, always, always going to be the same, 0.0831, because we are using moles and kelvins. Temperature is in kelvins, so for example, if room temperature is 20 degrees, to turn that into kelvins, you would take 20 plus 273 and get to 93. All right, so here's kind of putting it into action. If a cell's um, pressure potential is 3 and its solute potential is negative 4.5, what is the overall resulting water potential? Well, you would just add those things together. So you have 3 for pressure and negative 4.5 for solute. So when you put them together, you get negative 1.5. Okay, if a cell has an overall pressure potential, excuse me, water potential of negative 1.5, and you put it in a beaker of negative 4, will water flow into or out of the cell? It's always going to want to flow wherever it is higher to lower in terms of number. So negative 1.5 is higher, negative 4 is lower, um, meaning the negative 4 has more solutes. So it's going to flow out of the cell. Higher water potential to lower water potential. Okay, what is the water potential of a 0.1 molar solution of sucrose in an open container at 20 degrees? Well, because it's an open container, in this case, the pressure potential is zero, so we don't need to factor that in. We just need to factor solute potential. I is going to be one because sucrose is a singular molecule. C is the concentration, so that's 0.1. R is that constant, 0 0.0831, and T would be 293, because I took 20 degrees plus 273. And so collectively, when you put all that together, you get minus 2 bars. And that's the unit of measure for this thing, bars. All right, so here's another picture. Um, you're going to probably see this a ton with examples of osmosis and you can see that water would naturally want to end up rushing from the left side to the right side because um, there's way more solute over there but you can also look at it in terms of water potential um, and when that water does move it kind of pushes up the overall water in the tube so that creates what's called osmotic pressure whatever the difference is in the levels that's due to pressure that has built up Um, the water potential, you can even increase it if you put pressure on the right. So um, if you add more pressure to the one side, then it's going to change the overall um, situation. So that's where having that water um, potential coming from pressure can affect how things move. Okay. So that is finally the end. We're going to do tons of practice with these problems so that you begin to feel more comfortable with it and calculating. But in the back of your mind, if you can just remember that water is always going to move from where there is less solute to more solute. Um, and the more solute something has, the lower that water potential number is going to be. So things are moving from high water potential, where there's not a lot of solute, to where there's low water potential, meaning that there's a ton of solute. So if you can somehow create a picture in your mind of what that looks like, then you're going to be in good shape.